The people of the Aegean Sea carried the civilization of old Asia into the wilderness of Europe. When Heinrich Schliemann was a little boy, his father told him the story of Troy. He liked that story better than anything else he had ever heard, and he made up his mind that as soon as he was big enough to leave home, he would travel to Greece and find Troy. That he was the son of a poor country parson in a Mecklenburg village did not bother him. He knew that he would need money, but he decided to gather a fortune first and do the digging afterwards. As a matter of fact, he managed to get a large fortune within a very short time, and as soon as he had enough money to equip an expedition, he went to the northwest corner of Asia Minor, where he supposed that Troy had been situated. Here you see a picture of a Trojan horse. In that particular nook of old Asia Minor stood a high mound covered with grain fields. According to tradition, it had been the home of Priamus, the king of Troy. Schliemann, whose enthusiasm was somewhat greater than his knowledge, wasted no time in preliminary explorations. At once he began to dig, and he dug with such zeal and such speed that his trench went straight through the heart of the city for which he was looking, and carried him into the ruins of another buried town, which was at least a thousand years older than the Troy of which Homer had written. Then something very interesting occurred. If Schliemann had found a few polished stone hammers, and perhaps a few pieces of crude pottery, no one would have been surprised. Instead of discovering such objects, which people had generally associated with the prehistoric men who had lived in these regions before the coming of the Greeks, Schliemann found beautiful statuettes and very costly jewelry and ornamented vases of a pattern that was unknown to the Greeks. He ventured the suggestion that fully ten centuries before the great Trojan War, the coast of the Aegean had been inhabited by a mysterious race of men, who in many ways had been the superiors of the wild Greek tribes, who had invaded their country and had destroyed their civilization or absorbed it until it had lost all trace of originality. Here you see a picture of a mound that has several cities buried underneath different layers of sediment, and it's entitled Schliemann Digs for Troy. And this proved to be the case. In the late 70s of the last century, Schliemann visited the ruins of Mycenae, ruins which were so old that Roman guidebooks marveled at their antiquity. There again, beneath the flat slabs of stone of a small round enclosure, Schliemann stumbled upon a wonderful treasure trove which had been left behind by those mysterious people who had covered the Greek coast with their cities and who had built walls so big and so heavy and so strong that the Greeks called them the works of the Titans, those godlike giants who in very olden days had used to play ball with mountain peaks. Here you see a picture of Mycenae and Argolis, a man standing underneath a wall which has a very large arch in it. A very careful study of these many relics has done away with some of the romantic features of the story. The makers of those early works of art and the builders of these strong fortresses were no sorcerers, but simple sailors and traders. They had lived in Crete and on the many small islands of the Aegean Sea. They had been hardy mariners, and they had turned the Aegean into a center of commerce for the exchange of goods between the highly civilized East and the slowly developing wilderness of the European mainland. Here you see a picture of an Aegean ship on the Aegean Sea. It's got a sail, and it's being tossed about by the waves. For more than a thousand years, they had maintained an island empire which had developed a very high form of art. Indeed, their most important city, Snosis, on the northern coast of Crete, had been entirely modern in its insistence upon hygiene and comfort. The palace had been properly drained, and the houses had been provided with stoves, and the Znosians had been the first people to make a daily use of the hitherto unknown bathtub. The palace of their king had been famous for its winding staircases and its large banqueting hall. The cellars underneath this palace where the wine and the grain and the olive oil were stored, had been so vast and had so greatly impressed the first Greek visitors that they had given rise to the story of the labyrinth, the name which we give to a structure with so many complicated passages that it is almost impossible to find our way out once the front door has closed upon our frightened selves. But what finally became of this great Aegean empire and what caused its sudden downfall, that I cannot tell. 
the Cretans were familiar with the art of writing, but no one has yet been able to decipher their inscriptions. Their history, therefore, is unknown to us. We have to reconstruct the record of their adventures from the ruins which the Aegeans have left behind. These ruins make it clear that the Aegean world was suddenly conquered by a less civilized race which had recently come from the plains of northern Europe. Unless we are very much mistaken, the savages who were responsible for the destruction of the Cretan and the Aegean civilization were none other than certain tribes of wandering shepherds who had just taken possession of the rocky peninsula between the Adriatic and the Aegean seas, and who are known to us as Greeks. Here you see a large map that depicts the island ridges between Asia and Europe, which are a series of islands that connect um, Asia and its environs to different places in Europe. 